how are we feeling after hearing about chatbots? Yes, yes, interesting, innovation. That is what we are here to talk about, and it's been incredible so far. Um, our next speaker that I'm bringing up to this stage um, is also going to just extend on that even, even further, talking about the connection between uh, tech companies and law firms and how to really bridge that gap. The next person I'm going to bring to the stage is actually a previous pre president of the Washington Bar Association. He is the managing partner at Palace Law. And so without further ado, I'd love to bring to the stage Patrick Palace. Thank you, Jesse. I appreciate that very much. Wow, hi guys. How are you? Yeah? So I want you to imagine for a minute, if you will, what it would be like if all of us in our profession were like pilots. Now, with pilots, pilots, if we acted just like them and they acted just like us, imagine if, as a pilot, you could create an airline industry that built airlines, Boeing, McDonnell Douglas. Imagine if you could create an entire airport that looked like a shopping mall. Planes from all countries, thousands of airline companies all joining together. Imagine if you could create an entire travel industry around it that brought people everywhere they wanted to go on their own schedule. Imagine if all that possibility was out there and you're a pilot and you control it all. Do you really think any of that would exist if all of it were in the hands of the pilot? So what we're gonna to talk today about is this possibility that we as lawyers are using the smallest possible space of opportunity by simply being lawyers, by writing pleadings, by sitting at our desk doing lawyery things, just like pilots who just fly planes. There's such a bigger world out there of opportunity if, if we have the imagination, the vision, the innovation to stretch beyond the idea of us simply being the pilot flying the plane. So what we're gonna talk about for the next few minutes is about this idea of innovation, of partnerships, of building out the airport that really could truly be our profession if we could just imagine it and then create it. Here's the problem. One is that we as lawyers really don't have that vision to see how to do things like we need to. And there are tech companies out there who are making these amazing products every day. Like, gosh, we can do this, but what do we do with it? How do we apply that? And we have lawyers saying, gosh, I wish we had this thing to do these things we need, right? Which is why I think this is exactly right. You got one guy making a wheel and one guy making a fast food drive through and they're not connecting, right? This is lawyers who are thinking about, we should have the Indianapolis 500 if only we had a wheel. How do, what's a wheel? Uh, or, you know, uh, tech creating uh, a fast food drive through um, and, and us, or oh, the way around, tech creating fire, right? And us thinking, if only we had some giant barbecue or way to make an entire restaurant chain, right? It's, it's that link that's really critically important to us. And so in order for us to do that, there needs to be this important link, right? Collaboration of skills, of expertise, of ideas, of capital, right? That's really the missing piece that we have here. There was really interesting talk um, on a podcast this last week by Bill Henderson, who's wrote an amazing 
uh, paper for the California bar. And one of the things he emphasized, and I think that's critical here is, wouldn't it be cool if we could share money with tech companies, partnerships with money, but really what we need is the expertise, right? We know what we want, we just don't know how to get it. And that's, that's the missing piece for us. And partnerships are the answer. Where we have gaps in our expertise, we have gaps in our vision, or we have gaps in what we create, we have gaps in the bigger picture, other partnerships, maybe it's tech companies, maybe it's a marketing company, maybe it's accounting, maybe it's insurance, maybe it's project management, whatever it is, there's this whole world of expertise out there that we're not taking advantage of that a partnership with us as lawyers can solve and build infinitely into this much bigger profession where we could actually do these things like bridge that access to justice gap, start challenging that $500 billion latent market that's waiting for us to find it, right? Partnerships. Ah, uh, yes, but is that the end? Is there a happy ending in this story for us right now? We have this problem, and it's this rule. Law firms shall not share legal fees. Lawyers shall not form a partnership. Lawyers shall not practice with a non-lawyer. I gotta tell you, these are words that kill me. And hopefully they have some effect on you too because what we're seeing here in this rule of ethics that I think was created to protect us is an absolute set of handcuffs. We are siloed into a very small, limited practice where we could do endless things if we take down one or two or three or four of these things. So our destiny is to tear this one down, get out of our silo, and build the partnerships we need to, to create, to create the system that really has all of the answers rather than tinkering inside of this and tinkering and tinkering. But let me just imagine for a minute what it would look like if we did change that rule, right? So this is your chance to say, what would that be like? What would that be like, right? So if we had an alternative business structure model where maybe we have a firm that is 50% or more of lawyers and you bring in a tech company to help develop with you and you share fees and you make amazing products or maybe it's the way around, maybe there are large corporations that could really use lawyers in there as being partners with them to bring about change or affect faster, right? These are common models in other parts of the world, sadly not ours, but it can be bumped up a little bit more. What if instead of a one-on-one -on -one lawyer to a company, what if it's a lawyer or lawyers with whole groups of professions? Can you imagine the firepower that we could have if we could join with other experts and other areas of capital, right? Other companies, ideas, skill sets, cooperative partnerships, what innovation we could get from that. You know, we're talking about access to justice gap and we can't seem to solve it. We need more pro bono. Gah. But more practically, right, what would this do for you? How much more money could you make? How much more efficient could you be? How much more could you do for your clients if you had a world of expertise and capital and there was no barriers to your innovation or your thoughts, right? That's what this would look like. But for now, this is what we get. If you want a tech product, if you want a tech product to do whatever it is in your office, you probably have to buy one off the shelf. And you know what? There are lots of good tech products that you buy off the shelf. But this is a common problem for almost all of the products that it's a one size fits all. And that does leave us in a world where we are not one size fits all. 
If we went around the room right now and everybody came to a microphone and, and said what they did for a practice and what they need and what their goals are, I promise you they would all be different. One size fits all doesn't work well. So why not create something that is unique and customizable for you that you need in your firm that gives you a competitive advantage that tears down the problems that you're having to face, that gets you out of your silo and gives you the opportunity to do things you want to do. There's a way to do this. Did someone say this 5.4 is in your way? It is in your way, but look, there's ways around it. We're gonna spend the next few minutes talking about the ways around 5.4 so you can do all the things that I just talked about without, without violating the rules of ethics. So here is your 5.4 workarounds. So um, this is a really popular one, right? This is one that I think everyone does in one form or another uh, in your office now. Suppose you are, like in my case, a personal injury firm, and you get this massive class action case. And you say, you know, I'm really not a class action guy. I wish I had some skills and expertise. So what do you do? You join up with a firm that does massive class actions. Now I can do a mass tort in your little sole practitioner PI office, right? That's a pretty common scenario of a way to join the expertise. Just imagine if you could exponentially work that out for anything, but this is a good model for us here. But this model has gone beyond this for some people, and I, I like this uh, idea a lot. There's a, a company, um, er, 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 er. I just want to make sure I get the name of the company right. It's Lofty Law. Some of you may know Lofty Law. Uh, Todd Rickheimer, he got this idea that there are companies that probably could really use good marketing, uh, and, and you have to hire outside marketing companies to come in, and so what he's done is he created Lofty Law, where as a law firm, lawyer to lawyer, he does marketing, and he's created an algorithm for this marketing, right? Airbnb is now interested in his algorithm, and it's turning into be quite the project for him, but he operates as a law firm, but he does marketing. So if you, as a lawyer, want to have amazing marketing by access to this algorithm that gives you more clients, then you partner with him, and then you split the fees off the cases that get brought in, right? So again, it gets around 5.4, because attorney to attorney, you share fees, so there's ways to work around this. This is one that is, uh, uh, really common also, and I'm gonna give you a number of examples about doing this. So this is where you need a tool, and so you contract with a uh, tech company to work on that tool. Now the challenge with this model is that most people, I think, who want a tool and want to pay for it, pay a lot for it, right? Because you're, you're, you're getting a developer develop it from cradle to grave, right? You're developing the whole thing out on somebody's billable hour, right? Or a, on a giant uh, uh, price point to get this done. So maybe one of the better ways we're going to talk about this is why don't you be joint developers? You don't have to share fees, but you can share ideas and you can build projects and you can customize it. And I'll go into some detail about that in a few minutes. This is another model that gets around 5.4. If you're a lawyer and you want to do things that are in law, but you can't share fees with, as a law firm, start another company, right? I mean, we can all do this pretty easily. Creating another company is, is, is pretty easy filing for us to do. So you create, create your other company. Uh, let's take this one step back. So you're a lawyer in your own firm and you say, gosh, there's a partnership I wanna make, but I can't do it. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna step out of my law firm and I'm gonna create this other company using my name only, and then I'm going to do business with whoever I wanna do business with, and I'm going to create my new tool, I'm gonna to create my new invention, and then I'm probably gonna lease it back, or license it back to my law firm to use, or lease it or license it out to all of you who probably need a very similar tool, Right? Or maybe I'm gonna create a company that sells products and services to all the other lawyers out there because I've developed it as a lawyer and I know exactly what you need, and so this company can do that. One of the examples of something like this uh, is with Billy Tarasio, who 
is giving an amazing speech next door, and I'm a little torn that I'm out there watching Billy. I'm one of her fans, and it kills me that they put us opposite each other. Um, but so she's talking about her modern law practice, which is separate from her modern law firm, where her and, and Cura Legal have created an outside company where they're building a plug and play business model that you can use as a lawyer and it, it's developed the whole lawyer process to be more seamless, right? So it's an outside company that then caters to the needs of law firms that she's built outside of her law firm. It's another way to do this. Here's another way that's similar, this is the spin-off of that, rather than creating a whole company outside of yours, you have the company you wanna work with, you have your company, and then you create this joint venture. So the joint venture is you know, two or more people coming together to make profit for a limited, a limited purpose. So you're just there to develop a tool. You're there to make a piece of software. You're there to make a creation, right? And then you do with it what you will. So a good example of this is Google and NASA came together with a joint venture to create what? Google Earth, right? NASA had all the pictures, Google had the, the tech, they came together and they created, they created Google Earth. That's a perfect joint venture project. And so all of you could do that with any company you liked and create any project, platform, or idea that you want, and guess what? You don't violate 5.4. You just create a joint venture. Go make something. Nothing's stopping you from doing it. So I want to talk a little bit about how this might look in your firm. And I, I'm going to use my firm as an example not to wave my ego flag, uh, but just to show that we're a small law firm. Palace Law's not big and we don't have excessive capital. I don't do massive cases that bring in millions of dollars. We're absolutely nothing special whatsoever, but we've reached in to play with all of these models ourselves and see what works and what doesn't over this kind of evolution of time that we've done this. So this is, this is, the, this is the short story, right? One small firm, six ideas, six tech companies we've worked with in joint ventures or projects over 18 months. The result is that we increased our cases by 70 6%, we increased our gross revenue by 72%, and we did that without any advertising costs. Maybe the takeaway from this, this isn't a big deal. Anybody can do this. It's available to us if you just choose to think a little outside and to get what you want and to empower yourself to believe that it's all there waiting for you. If you can imagine it, you can create it. And in our firm, we try to create things as fast as we can imagine them. So let me just go through a couple of these uh, for a few minutes, and I'll make them quick, but you'll get the sense. So there's a company named, a company named Metager, um, really an amazing company. Its tool is a search engine. They have an extremely powerful search engine. They developed it geez, 15 years ago, at least, during e-discovery, where you go through millions of documents of discovery and pull out the very documents you want, answer your interrogatories in two hours when you have 10 million documents. Metager did that. They created it. What we wanted with Metager was a tool that they hadn't created yet, but they had the technology to do it. We said, because we do a lot of work with the government, and the government holds all of our discovery information, all of the data that we need. We do workers' compensation work. And so we wanted a tool that would go in every night and scrape the government website of all of the data pertaining to our cases, and then give it to us in the middle of the night. So when we come into the office in the morning, there is all the data. No more requests, no more waiting, no more, right? It just, it just bypassed them altogether. So, manager created a key for us that goes in and scrapes, and then we had to create this platform where it delivers it all to us to be used the way you want to use it. What did it cost us? Tens of thousands of dollars? 
No, it was, it was almost free because we put in half the time to develop what we needed and the way it was to be used and exactly how to do it. They gave us the tech tools to create it and now they have a tool that they can share with anybody in this country how to scrape a government website and get data and give it to you in a digestible way you can use. This is another one. This is a company named CoralDocs. CoralDocs came to us and CoralDocs said, I got this really cool tool. What it does is you give me any set of documents or a book and we can organize the book by relevance from the most relevant word to the least relevant rule, 999 categories. And so like, okay, what does that look like? So they give us Alice in Wonderland and they give us Alice in Wonderland from most relevant to least relevant, one to 999, guess what the most relevant word was? Rabbit. Rabbit. And they said, can you use this? Uh, we thought about it. Can we use this? You know what? I think we can. There's, there's a way that we can use your fire wheel and do something useful for us. So what we did is we ended up creating a uh, method to name all the documents that come into our office, right? So we scrape everything from the government website. You get this mass of data. You get all of your mail that comes in, right? And we needed something that named it all and filed it all for us. Because having one person sit down and identify 500 pieces of mail every day and then put it in its respective file folder for our attorneys who then have to open that file folder as their mail the next morning turned out to be just a lot of work. But if we had something that auto-named everything and then put it in its place for us, so when the lawyers come to work in the morning and they want to do their work, they can see everything that happened overnight with the government and all of their mail and it's sitting in their Trello board to open up for that case and see what's there and then to handle it as they wish. No more processing, right? What did this tool cost us? It took us about three months to develop. It was a lot of our time, it was a lot of their time, but it didn't cost us anything. It truly was a joint venture to put this together. But now their tool is out there and they're selling it across the country and it costs some money now, yes it does, but that's part of this joint venture idea, right? That you develop it with them, you get the tool for free or for very low cost just for your time and energy, and then they go make money off it. Then there's the pad bot. It's a chat bot, right? So having Josh Browder here was, was timely. We wanted to have a chat bot um, that's a total DIY system in our office. So if you come to our homepage and you are an injured worker, let's say, and you want to know if you have issues in your case and what those issues are, because most of our clients don't know the issues, or even if they have a case, right? Don't your clients always say, do I have a case? All right, well, we wanted everybody to have access to that for free. So 24 seven now, you can go onto our website, you answer a dozen questions very easily, very quickly, and push a button, and it gives you the list of all the issues it finds the issue. It's like an instant bar exam uh, answering tool. It identifies all the issues in your case and tells you about the law surrounding those issues. And then if you, as an injury worker, want to take action, you push the action button and it opens up the pleadings and the forms and the things that you might want, right? Very useful for people who don't want to hire a lawyer or maybe want some help along the way. But we needed a partner to do that because I'll tell you what, I don't build chatbots. I'm not a chatbot expert. I don't know the first thing about how to do the tech behind that. But our friends at LawDroid did, and so you know, it, it took me quite some time to map out 350 statutes out of the Industrial Insurance Act and 100 years of law and put it into a Q&A in a very short process. That's stuff you guys can do that tech companies can't. But the tech companies can then give you the, 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 the method to deliver it. They build the framing around it and you have an amazing project. And again, because we did this, it cost us little to nothing. But now, Tom Martin LawDroid has this template now to make chatbots and is doing it for people around the country. This was one of our first projects with Alan Rodriguez of, of uh, 1-400. Um, our clients 
I think, wanted a tool to know what the value of their case is. Doesn't everyone ask you, what's my case worth? Right? Do I have a case? What's it worth? So we wanted a way to evaluate cases. And so what that took, again, was a lot of behind the scenes time of mine, having practiced this law for 25 years, I had a pretty good sense of what a, you know, a mental algorithm might look like, and so charted out the process in which to determine a very clear value of everyone's case. And then we gave that over to Alan at one for 100, who then built the consumer friendly math-based process that would make this very simple. So when you come to the website as a, as a potential client, you answer three questions and it tells you the value of your case and I've had fun going out there on the radio and advertising telling people that we're keeping uh, the government honest because this is what you should get in your case. If you're not getting that case, come see me, right? And it's worked very nicely. Again, what was the cost of doing this? Little to nothing, because they couldn't have created this value calculator without us doing all of the groundwork to create the tool, because we were the knowledge experts. But we're not knowledge experts in, you know, putting together the calculation into a form that you push buttons on a computer. So it's a partnership to create that, and this is what we got. So I will tell you that all of those projects combined I don't, know, I don't know if we spent, I don't know, maybe, maybe a couple thousand dollars cash total. All of it was with our time and our expertise coupled with a company, companies who saw value in a product that they could duplicate over and over again across the country and make real money on it. And I'm great with that. This was another, and there's only a couple more of these, but I, I, I share them because I'm, I'm hoping that while I'm talking about these things, that you guys got wheels spinning, like, you know what? I could do that. Oh, I could do this. Here's an idea we could, we could create. I mean, there's a lot of power in this room right here. If all of you had just one project, think how much how much more impact we could have in providing efficient law to consumers that need it to lower the costs, right? To do the thing that Jack was talking about on his very first words about lowering, bridging access to justice. And I'll tell you what, the other important part of this is, this is also about, let's, let's realize this. I mean, we're, we are entrepreneurs, we're business people. We're here to make money. Nobody can run a pro bono firm and make money. We, we may have the inside of us to do the right thing, and we should do the right thing, but we can make real money doing it. There's no reason you can't have your cake and eat it too, and this is one of the methods to do it. All right, right so box. Okay, I'm off. So this is another thing that we created, and this is funny, because this one we've now done, I don't know, a year and a half ago, two years ago? But it seems to be catching some, some fire around here. This is one of those talks of this, this conference. This is about the intake process, right? Like Flexicata's talking about, and now Cleo has taken over. We couldn't find a tool out there. One size fits all did not work for us. We could not do an intake form the way any program did it. So we did this in-house. We simply took Google Sheets and, and put in the questions that, that we would ask our potential clients. And as our potential clients talk to us on the phone, we type in the answers, right? All of that information goes into a database, and we just kept collecting it. It was the easiest tool to create. For us, we could do it in-house. Now, I'm not saying that we're totally tech ignorant, we have people like Jordan Couch and my project manager, manager, Sienna Powell, who are really good with this stuff. And so maybe we had a little bit of help there, but neither one are trained in technology or have any background in it. It's just stuff they play with. And so we created this on our own. But we wanted to take it to the next step, right? Because you want to hear about a partnership. The theory was we have 18 months of data 
on every client we've spoken to, every potential client we've ta- spoken to, we know their injury, we know their doctor, we know how severe the injury is, the status of their case, where they're from, right? We know all this stuff. There's value in that. What we wanted was a predictive analytic that said, when we answered these 12 questions, should we take this case or should we not take this case? What's the probability of this case being a good case at the end of the day versus being a bad case at the end of the day? So we reached out to Suffolk Law School and to David Calaroso, who I am a fan of. And David's class started working on an algorithm that predicted the likelihood of success for each of our cases when someone calls in. So someone calls in, we start taking notes. We have an algorithm that tells us the likelihood of the outcome of that case being good. Should we take that case, should we not take that case? And the cool thing about this algorithm is it's smart. It learns with every data input. And so our likelihood of knowing exactly which case to take or not to take gets better every day. Do you think that helps with consistency of taking in cases when you have a newer lawyer or maybe a paralegal trying to find the right set of cases? This helps do that. But you know what, this is just the beginning for us, right? Imagine this tool and we have the uh, 90 down here at the bottom where you're typing in and as the facts get better, it gets closer to 100. Take this case, this is a great case or goes closer to zero, run, don't take this case, right? Love that possibility. But it really does get better because as we take these cases and we work them over a year or years, we put in our database what happened in that case. Litigation, no litigation. Settlement, how much was the settlement? How much time do we put in that case? Right? How tough was it to get through? How easy was it to get through? Minimal hours, maximum dollars? Settled it in six months? Years and years and years of litigation with corporation after corporation pounding us on this thing and fighting the state and made $1.95 at the end? We want to know all that. So all this is going to be dumped into this algorithm. So not only will we, will we be able to say on the initial phone call with the first 10 questions, should we or should we not take the case? But then have the predictive analytic to say, and this is the likely outcome based on these years of entering data into this database to be utilized by the algorithm. Okay. What did it cost me to put this thing together? You know, our own time and reaching out to somebody like David Calarusso who does this. But now, you know what? Other people are doing it. We, uh, um, Jared, who's put together the Gideon, um, I'll say Gideon project, but it's actually a, a tool called Gideon, who's here, is creating something just like this. And he's gonna make it open for everyone to buy as his tool, right? And I think you may see that Cleo and Lexa Cotter started heading down this road too, because this is, a, I think, a pretty cool tool. But it didn't cost us a dollar to create. We just knew we needed something like this and then reached out to find out who had the technology to create a tool like this. <clears throat> I promised that I'd talk about just not, uh, you know, projects with tech companies, but actually a joint venture. So as we've kind of progressed through this timeline of learning and learned more about how to partner and how to stay outside of 5.4 without getting in trouble and how to maximize profits and how to create tools that our clients can use to better them and how to create tools that we need and what these financial structures look like, we've become um, better. So we started moving into joint ventures. And we have a number of these going right now that I'd love to tell you about, but it's a secret. But this one's not, so I'll tell you about this one. Uh, This is a a joint venture with with Tom Martin at LaDroid. And it came up this way. I don't know about you guys, I try to be a good typist and sit at my desk and and, and data entry, all the stuff, 
And the first thing for me that just slowed me down every day, you're talking with your client, hello client, yada, 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 thank you client, goodbye, boom. Okay, time for a note into Clio. So you pull up the case, you get to the note section, you start typing in your notes. I have a lot more to say than I want to type. I mean, my phone's already ringing with the next phone call, and I'm short on time, and I have like three more paragraphs to write in my notes, and I don't have time to do it. And maybe I shortcut the note and just put it in, you know, shortcut version. But wouldn't it be nice to put everything in that you wanted? And I thought, there's got to be a way around this. So we said, what if we could just dictate all of this in? What if we created a tool that was just all voice command? And what if we created a tool that's all voice command for not only our notes, but for virtually everything that Clio does? What if you just never had to use your keyboard anymore? What if you could just talk at your computer and do everything that Clio does? And so uh, we reached out to a number of companies to see who could do this, where the technology was. If there's Alexa out there and Siri out there, right, and Cortana, why couldn't there be you know, a law voice or something like that for us. So, Tom Martin said, I think we can do this. And so we formed a joint venture to create this voice command system for your office. And we're using it in our office, so I'll beta testing. If any of you are curious to try it, it's free. It doesn't cost you anything. Try it out. Screw it up. I have a 17-year-old son, and, and he is a computer geek, and I love him to death. And what I do is I give him everything we're creating and say, Go break it. And he breaks everything all day long. He's my number one beta tester on everything that we do. And he wrecks everything. When we had our, when we had our, our chat bot, I said, there, we fixed it. You can't break this. His name's Winston. You can't break this, Winston. Go ahead and try. And the first thing he does is he types into the chat bot, I love you. Swear to God, the thing crashes. We can't even start it back up again. I'm like, how do you know these things? <laughs> anyway, so be great to have all you guys crashing this for us. Wreck it as many times you can. One of the themes, by the way, to creating all of these tools is uh, love the failure, right? Fail, 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 fail fast so you, so you can succeed faster, right? Don't be put off by the idea that you are failing because you didn't get this tool up or you can't figure out how to do it. It just takes a little bit of time. There's a little patience that comes along with breaking it. But you know, there's that, uh, that story about the guy who's trying to, it's a longer story, but here's the shortest version possible. Every time you fail, it's one more thing. You don't have to try again because you're closer to the answer. And so you just keep creating. You just keep trying. And it gets there until one day you have these projects that work, these tech tools that work, your office is more efficient, you're doing better things for your clients. This is one of those tools right now because you know what? It doesn't, it doesn't um, take all commands for all things on Clio, but it will. And then it may expand to lots of other things too. So what does it take? What has it taken for us to do this? Really nothing more than having an idea, knowing of what the need in our office is and saying, I wonder if everybody else has that need too. If you guys are lazy typists like I am, or maybe not a great typist like I am, or maybe you're a great typist, you just would rather dictate from the other side of your office while you're staring out at the palm trees or something rather than sitting at your desk staring at your, at your keyboard. Right? There's ways to do this stuff. So what's next? Well, anything really, but I like this idea. What if there was a tool out there where you said, I have a legal idea, and you could go to a place with this hungry shark tank of tech developers who say, we have an idea, and you could mix and mingle a little, right? It's an idea that we're, uh, playing with, and frankly, an idea that I love to put together, and I don't care if we make a dime off it, I just think it's one of those things that would be cool to have a marketplace where everyone could meet and you can find developers. I don't know about you guys, if, if I went around the room and said, actually, just, let's, let's just try this out. How many people here have a phone number in your phone or uh, quick access to a developer to make you anything you want to make? I see one, two, three, 
right? That's, that's the problem, right? We just, we don't know, we don't network so good, we don't know who are those people are or how to find them. It's one of the problems with us being so siloed in our profession. We don't know how to get outside to the other experts who do all these cool things that other companies can do, like legal Zoom, right, or Rocket Lawyer. No one's, no one's putting them in a silo. They get to go raise $50 million. They get to partner with anybody they want to partner with. They get to create these amazing tools and platforms that the entire country can use for $79 for a will. And where are we? Yeah. So, um, a tool like this, which isn't here yet, but maybe, and maybe one of you will create it, of finding a match.com where we can put developers who are looking for our business and our business looking for a developer to grow it would be a very simple solution. I would love to see that, and if I have my way, I'll try to help create that. Um, but it's one of the things I think we'd all be bettered by. So let me close with a couple of thoughts about this. Everything that we did wasn't expensive. Everything we did is everything every last person in this room could do. I'd like to think that if all of us felt empowered to go do these things, that we really could take a crushing blow to the access to justice gap and really could make a lot more money than we're all making. Uh, and helping to bridge that relationship with a marketing expert, with an accounting expert, with an insurance expert, right? With a clash action expert, with a tech expert, do anything we wanted to do, means you don't have to wait for the one size that fits all for you. You can go do anything you want to do. Right? We were just talking about three passions. What three things might you do in your life? What are your alternatives? Is one of those alternatives perhaps going out and developing cool things for your own office? Does that give you some excitement? It gives me a lot of excitement. So what I want to leave you with um, is this idea that there really is endless possibility out there that you could go out there and dream to make your own seamless intake or a faster workflow or increase new clients or anything else you want to do, that you need to get rid of your silo, get outside of that box of thinking that says, I'm a lawyer, I do pleadings, I type right at my desk. And open it up and don't limit yourself to do anything at all. Go create what you want to do. And the fun thing about that is that once you go outside of your silo and once you build partnerships, then you're no longer stuck as a lawyer, and you can go out and be your own pilot and build your own infrastructure. So go out there and go build an airport. Go do everything that you know you can do as a lawyer to make this world a lot better, to serve your community, to make yourself a lot of money, to get outside your box, and a personal wish, help me kill 5.4. It's killing all of us. Let's get rid of this rule and open up this opportunity for all of us to do this. All right, I'm done. Thank you very much. I appreciate you all being here and talking. I have a, a couple of minutes, right? Yeah, to answer uh, questions that you may have or frankly, hear from you. What did you create? What do you have? What do you wanna talk about? So happy to answer any questions or give you more coffee time. And I've, I've got a mic for you if we, if we do have questions here. Does anyone have a question? Yes, one moment here. So I have a question and kind of a point to add on this that I think is something that's important. You talked a little bit about you know, failing fast. And I think one thing that's important, because as someone who has to pitch ideas to you and you can't give me a million dollars to do whatever I want, what is the importance of finding you know, minimum viable products and there's something that works even if it isn't good, even if it isn't great, but it works and then you can build off of that? Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, no, I think it's critical, right? Because it, it's kind of that whole tech idea that if you create a, um, a tool but you're not gonna release it or use it until you develop it from A to Z and it's perfect, you're probably never gonna release it and you're probably never actually gonna make it. The cool thing about this whole 
tech process, which is so unlike a lawyer process. I mean, can you imagine putting out your pleadings like, well, I wrote half of it, it sounds pretty good, we'll just file this now and see what happens. If the judge says it's not good, I'll just rewrite a little more paragraphs and send it to him again, right? It's not part of our thinking process. But if you get in the idea where you have an idea and you just start chewing on it, start making it, develop part of it, toss it out for beta testing, maybe it fails, maybe it thrives, Chances are, if it's a good idea, it fits a need. You just keep working on it, keep chewing on it, and it gets better, and it comes to life, and then you become a real product that is really valuable. It's the journey, it really is the journey. If you think you can envision the entire product, exactly how it works, and exactly what it's gonna do, oh, good luck, I'm glad, I mean, that's cool, but it's probably gonna be that journey of making it. So any idea you have, start working on it, put it, to, put it in, in some sort of form, and start to grow it. Um, Twitter, great idea to share ideas, great place to find expertise, great way to expand your knowledge, great way to share friends and find partners, right? These, this is this, this marketplace that's already out there for us. Oh, and over here. Almost like how Cleo grew from Catherine Reisman to all of you. <laughs> so, um, I work with a lot of different companies across a lot of different industries, and n none of them, aside from legal professionals, deal with 5.4. But I still, <laughs> see, I still see the same variation in willingness to build partnerships, use new tech tools, try new things in other industries as I do in the legal profession. I'm wondering if there isn't something else um, in in, I, you know, I work with startups, I work with smaller companies, and I do see a difference in mindset. And after um, hearing uh, Kelly McGonigal yesterday, it's just kind of gotten me thinking about mindset. Do you think there's something there, not to call out anyone or to kind of put the spotlight on lawyers, but I'm wondering if there's something there. Yeah. It, it comes, for me, it comes down to an, an old, I think it's an Indian proverb, uh, the mind can't know what the eyes can't see, or well, the eyes can't see what the mind doesn't know. If, if, you're, it, if it's something you can't imagine or you haven't seen, it's really hard for us to take that cultural leap and say, I can go do that, because you don't have a model. You, someone's never navigated it before. It's much easier when someone says, here's an iPhone. Like, oh, I can you know, push the numbers in the iPhone, we're great. It is a cultural thing. It, it's, a, you know, it's a coming of age thing that I, that I see happening with the most successful lawyers in our profession that are building these great tools, creating these companies, finding these joint ventures. But it's not part of our culture yet. And one of the reasons it's not part of our culture is because we have 5.4 that tamps us down to think we have to stay inside of our silo and we can't ever get out. We can't reach over and look, right? So yes, hopefully this kind of discussion and the kind of things that Clio is doing and the, and the whole array of tech products are here and the ideas being generated, they could get us out of that mindset of having to stay in our silo and never coming out to play. And if we round that corner, I think there's amazing things that will happen for the entire profession Individually, we will build ourselves in a more profitable, happier place. And as Kelly suggested, right, it'll be good stress for all of us to live happier lives and to expand what we do. Right? Yeah. So I have, um, I'm the owner of a virtual legal assisting company. Nice. And I am constantly, I, we handle more of the intake and everything like that, so I'm constantly seeing the different systems that all these different law firms use, and we, being new eyes to the firm, try to come up with new systems for them that would work Perfect. better. Yeah. What is your strategy, strategy when you're reaching out to these companies when you have ideas as far as something that would work, what is your strategy to reaching out to them and you know, delivering your idea with one, not offending them and them saying, hey, well, this is not what we do, goodbye, and actually getting them to have those open ears? You know, everybody has their own, their own style, their own strategy, and I'm sure that you have yours that probably works very well for you. I think it's an individual approach to how you reach out to tech companies. <laughs> My approach that may not surprise you 
is like super excited cheerleader, let's do this, this is so exciting, right? That's, that's my approach. Um, I motivate uh, companies to see this picture from, from our vision and help them imagine what this space would look like if they filled it and the opportunities that are available to them just like the available, uh, opportunities available to us and that together we can make these really amazing things. Let's do this. And, I, I, it happens. It just, it just, it just happens. Um, I don't know if any of you listened to uh, Mark Britton. He did uh, a podcast uh, with Bob Ambrosi uh, last week or so. And one of the things that Mark said, you know, he created Avo, but one of the things that he said I thought really stuck with me, which was if you have an idea and it's keeping you up at night and you find yourself thinking about it all the time, then you have to do it. If it's what drives you, then go get it. Go get it. And I think that's part of what helps build that bridge with tech companies, because there are ideas that I may have, or our people in our company may have, or that you have, that excite you, and you see the possibilities. Go get it. If it's keeping you up, go, right? And that's the way I talk to, to other companies. And I don't know, it works for me. You guys may have a different approach. Maybe there's one that's logical and profit-based and comes with a business plan. That's great too, whatever works. Um, I also am a broad-based, transformational, across professions consultant and have been for a long time. And so what's going on here is actually part of a much larger picture that's going on in every other industry. And I know that you're very focused on 5.4, but I, I actually think that if you visit some of the other professions that aren't dealing with it, they are dealing with very similar things from a different mm -hmm. perspective. So 5.4 holds in place a monopoly that your license purchases. And so to talk to a bunch of taxi drivers about Uber, you know, is not a happy making thing. But the problem with it is that the ship has sailed. This whole thing is happening, it's been happening now and it's happening across cultures. So there's no resisting it. It's going to fall someday, you know, right now, confidentiality is up for grabs, innocent until proven guilty up for grabs. So, you know, the whole thing is actually a part of a much larger picture that is already gone. It's not something to continue to worry about. But anyway, in the process of all of this, I'm very focused on the legal community right now because it is such an opportunity. It is such an awesome time to be a lawyer and be involved in the, in the practice of law. And so I really thank you for your presentations. Um, one thing in the process of all of it, we've become a clearinghouse for all of the technology of the law. And if you've got something you want to develop, I can put you in touch with the developer in about two seconds. Love that. Thank you. Right behind you from Jesse. And I'll, I'll just touch on that, the idea that we are a monopoly. We used to be a monopoly. I think some of us think we still are a monopoly, but we're not really a monopoly. And to the degree that we hold some monopoly by only we can practice law, you know, fight the unauthorized practice of law in court and crush those bastards that are, that are, that are, that are invading in our space is really, I, I think, a false whole premise because they're winning, we're losing our monopoly to the degree we have it is getting smaller and smaller and more engaged in a limited set of handcuffs and they're expanding from the lowest rung of people who need the cheapest services and working their way right up through the economy while we sit still. This is why we need to take these steps, right? So thank you for raising that. Yeah, good point, good point. Hello. It's hot. All right. Hey, first off, I wanna say excellent presentation. Um, and second to that, I, I wanted everybody just to look around real quick. Um, and with an excellent presentation, there's not a lot of people in this room. Uh, that has nothing to do with your presentation. <laughs> but I think it has everything to do with building an awareness and value uh, around why a partnership 
is necessary and effective. And I would love to get your thoughts on how do we build momentum in this area because I, I truly believe, like you, that lawyers can benefit greatly from strategic partnerships in this area. But if it's so valuable, why aren't they here today? So can you give us some ideas? How do we help build that momentum to benefit the lives and well-being of attorneys? Yeah, so there's a much bigger speech here, but here's a really short version. I am pretty darn clear that if one of us takes any one of these things and makes a lot of money doing it, everyone else will follow. You know, money builds a following. You build a Google, whoosh, right? You build Uber, everyone follows, right? You find that magic tool. You make money and show everyone how much money you're making, everyone else is gonna be right behind you. And so as much as I'd love to run around the country and give this talk, where we talk, we had, you know, yesterday we did the town hall and the future profession and give that talk and, and, and preach and cheerlead about this, I think the strongest thing I can do and the strongest thing you can do is take one of these tools and go make just a god-awful amount of money and wave it around and hope that everyone else follows you because if they're smart and they want to make money, they'll follow you too. That's the way we're going to make change.